Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the, the goal in doing the album was really just to perform. I hadn't really thought of what I was going to do beyond that. Um, but I realized, you know what, um, uh, if you have four kids, you really got to feed them more than once a week. Right. Um, so, you know, it's like we have this, um, artist here, Jan Arden in Canada who said, um, you know, at Canada, you can, in Canada, you can headline at Maple Leaf Gardens and still have to take the subway home. And that's kind of like, I guess Maple Leaf Gardens would be like, um, Madison Square Gardens in New York or maybe Wembley Stadium in, in Britain. Um, you know, so, so it doesn't matter how successful you are, at least at that time in the music business. And what I was doing was never going to be commercially broadly successful anyway, because it was kind of more folk and world beat and funny song and things like that, kind of more esoteric, eclectic stuff. So, so it really, at a certain point, I mean, how long can you do that? You know, you have four little kids. And isn't that what running your business is all about? Having to feed your kids. And Two Feet makes a really good point about having to do that. And it doesn't matter what project we have in mind, what kind of business we are setting up, thinking that we can just go off and start on our own without a boss looking over our shoulder. But we still have to realise that at the end of the day, we still have kids to feed and ourselves to feed and the mortgage to pay or the rent to pay. This was a really super discussion and I'm sure you're going to really enjoy it. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Sufit. How are you today? I'm I'm awesome, Michael. And it two feet. Two feet, feet. Like feet. Yeah. So yeah, I struggle with that because it's a really unusual name. And I also want to ask you about that, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. So, and I, can I just tell you about the pronunciation yes, or, or do you want me to yeah. tell you that in a minute? Yeah. So I, I was doing a radio show in the US and the hosts, every host always asked me right three seconds before we go on the air, you know, Sufid, how do you pronounce your name? And uh, usually they say like you did, Sufit. And, I, and so I said to her, no, no, feet. Feet, feet, two feet, like feet, right? Right, like so human so feet, she, yeah. Right, right. I didn't say like human feet, but I said <laughs> two feet, like feet, right? Yeah. So, and this is on live terrestrial radio, right? Like what people call like real radio station, right? So we're live. And uh, she goes, hello, everybody, and welcome. Today we have award-winning author, da, 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 two foot. <laughs> so she remembered the feet part. <laughs> She just didn't get it exactly <laughs> right. So there you go. So I thought, you know, so Michael, just just for your listeners, before we went on the air, Michael said, like every host always does, yes. every good host, Sufid, how do you pronounce your name? And I said, you know what? Ask me that on the air. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> so that's the story. So And, and then the last second, I did tell him right, and he still called me Sufit. <laughs> got a I great laugh, quite, Michael. Yeah, Sufit. Yeah. Sufit. There you go. So... So let's go into the name then a little bit further, because um, when I was looking for you on Skype, I saw a lot of people in Israel that have that name. So my first question then is, please share a little bit about, you know, your personal life. With that, I mean, where were you born? Where did you get educated, etc.? And, and did you move around and where do you now live? So maybe the name will come out of that. If not, I've got other questions on the name as well. <laughs> so Snoopy, Snoopy, Snoopy. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, so first of all, interesting that you should say that you found a lot of people from Israel with that name because the most common question that I get is, is it French, right? Because right. people, you know, Sasufi sounds kind of like that. Um, no, people, it's not French. It is, in fact, a Hebrew name. Right. I was, yes, born in Israel. Um, I was born in Jerusalem, wow. and um, it, it's funny to me that you say you see many people um, with that name because there aren't really that many people with that name. Mm. Um, there, there are a few other versions of it, like Tzofit or things like that, which have a different meaning. Um, Sufit actually means uh, like a hummingbird or a sunbird. Oh, uh, that's Suf nice. is nectar of honey, and the hummingbird collects the nectar of oh. honey. My dad used to call me Suf. Yeah. So that's 
the story of that name. And I remember once I was at a wedding in Israel when I was younger, and I hear this woman calling two feet. And until that point in my life, I had been the only two feet I'd ever heard of because I grew up in Canada. And so I turn around when she calls two feet. Obviously, she's talking to me. And she goes, no, no, I'm looking for my niece. And I and I said, produce the aforementioned niece, <laughs> produce the alleged niece that you're talking about, because I didn't believe that there was another person in the world with that name. Wow. Um, and there was, but she was younger than me, so I could still claim to be the first. <laughs> That's brilliant. And then, so you were you were born in Israel. And, and, I was born there, yeah. And, and so how did you get to Canada? And is that the... Oh. Was that the first jump or did you move somewhere no, else? No, 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 not first jump. Uh, so I left Israel with my parents when I was eight months old. Uh, my dad, may he rest in peace, was a math professor. And so he came to the U.S. to do postdoctoral stuff. He went to Lawrence, Kansas. He went to New Haven, Connecticut, to Yale. He went to um, Stanford in Palo Alto, where my brother was born. Um, he, where else were we in the U.S.? I forget. Oh, a bunch of places. And then um, he got his first, like, you know, professor, professor job uh, that wasn't like temporary visiting places um, in Canada. So I guess um, I'm not sure exactly how old I was. Maybe, well, I. Probably between, probably around four. My sister was born in Canada. The only one of our whole family was born in Canada when I was four and a half. Right. Um, and 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 I ended up, um, um, yeah, staying here. Great. And and so your education was what in the U.S. mostly or both? Assuming I, you're assuming I'm educated. Um, <laughs> so I went to yeah, I went to school here in. Canada. I went to um, undergrad, a four-year university here in Canada, and then I took a law degree uh, also here in Canada. So all my studies were here. I became a lawyer. Um, and, um, you know, I've traveled around the world, but my base is here. You know, when I was growing up, we used to think of Canada as kind of the baby brother of the U.S., kind of like, you know, the Midge to the Barbie doll, kind of like the Rhoda to Mary Tyler Moore, you know, kind of the second, um, the, uh, like the best friend, the, you know, the, the supporting, best supporting actor role, right? We mm. think of it as kind of the little brother. Um, recently, it's become clear to us what an amazing place, uh, or at least to me, what an amazing country this is. Mm. Except for the ice storm that, that could or could not um, delay a live interview with a fellow from the UK. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and the weather obviously has an impact on everybody. I appreciate that. But, I mean, when it's not so long ago, right, that a lot of people in the US were going to leave there and move to, the U to Canada because they wanted to get out, right? Yeah, yeah, they wanted to do it in the 60s and they wanted to do it again recently. <laughs> I won't I won't get political unless you want to, but yeah. No, no, uh, we're not going to we're not going to Yeah. Well, we might touch on it. No. Anyway, we won't. No, people we won't. but people people appreciate our country, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for the kind of journey of how you ended up in Canada. And when you did all your education, etc., what was the first job that you did? Well, I had summer jobs when I was, um, so I'll go back to before I completed my education. So, mm. um, you, you know, I don't know if you have McDonald's in the UK. I'm sure you oh, have. But yes. that was my first kind of real job, you know, when I was 17. If there's time to lean, there's time to clean. For a oh. $1.90 ninety an hour for a three-hour shift. Mm. Um, and then, you know, little part-time jobs. I, I had a job singing at an outdoor cafe because I'm also a singer. So that was a, a, a little cafe called the Summer Pantry. I, I have a photo of me singing um, when I was in my teens. Um, but then you're, after I um, – and so I had summer jobs. But after I left law, uh, finished my education, yeah, my first job was articling and then as a lawyer. And I worked as a lawyer for 10 years. Wow. And, well, that must have been fascinating. Were you 
on your own or were you with a you know a group of people in a company yeah i was never on my own i was um in small firms um so i went to articling interviews with big and small firms and i was offered in big firms i was offered in small firms but i ended up going with a firm i think about 14 people um and then i went to another firm with about 14 pe- you know just kind of small um intimate firms i was doing civil litigation Right. Which is the, um, you know, civil litigators are the actors of the legal profession. Uh, so that jived with what I ended up doing later, which I'll tell you about when you ask me. Um, but, um, yeah, performing for judges and, and uh, you know, the juicy, the juicy stories in, in, in law is what we were doing. So could you explain a little bit when you say they're the actors of the legal profession? Because I've never heard that. I'm not, I'm not legally trained. So it doesn't mean anything to me, but I'd be fascinated to hear what that means. Well, it just means that a civil litigator, uh, litigators are the ones who go to court. So like, you know, Perry Mason, you know, so, so most lawyers are actually solicitors, I guess you'd say in in Britain, right? Um, And I was, I guess what you guys would have called a barrister. Right. Um, You know, here all our cards would say barrister and solicitor. But I think actually my first job, it only said barristers, which was interesting because we don't even use that term here. really. No. Um, But anyway, yeah. So the ones who go to court. So they're the ones who stand up and talk for a living. Um, Although the truth is you don't do that every day there anyway. But that's kind of the glamorous backstory. So. Okay. So you did that for, you said. Ten ten years. Yeah. While I was popping out. Well, I was popping out babies every, I had four daughters in four years wow. and I was the f- first pregnant lawyer they had ever had. <laughs> um, and, um, there was only one other female lawyer there at the time. And, uh, right after I had my baby, she had hers, I guess she was afraid to <laughs> until I got there. Right. And then, and then every year I had one and they were saying like, seriously, is this going to be a thing? You know? So, um, yeah, I had four daughters in just under um, four and a half years. Wow. So what what made you decide to leave and what did you do next? Well, they weren't too thrilled about, you know, the baby a year thing. Um, And I guess they were afraid I was going to have my fifth baby. So they gave me a gentle push. And, you know, the truth is that I wanted always to um, be an actress, a singer, So the timing was kind of right because I kind of wanted to spend some time with my daughters. Um, We had help, you know, before that. And so I stayed home after the fourth was not right away, but about like eight months to a year later, I stayed home for a while. And um, that is when I did my music CD right? uh, called Under the Mediterranean Sky um, and started with the acting. I was in a an East Side Mario's commercial that's a like a a restaurant. I was in a cinema commercial in Europe. Um, I mean, I did it here, but it was for the European cinema. Mm. Uh, I did, uh, I was in a a, a sitcom, a Canadian sitcom for kind of tween, like young teenagers for four years playing um, an evil cafeteria lady called uh, Ludmila Kropotnik. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and um so that was fun i had this evil laugh um and um yeah so so that was kind of the change and then after you know a few years of doing that uh well so i had four babies and i and i had this album that i had made it took about 14 months to make the album hmm. uh quicker to pop out a kid than to pop out an album <laughs> um and uh, so after that, I had, you know, a, a basement full of CDs. And I thought, well, I better learn how to sell these. Yes. Um, so, so I read a lot about publicity and um, learned how to get media attention. So I would get, you know, newspaper articles about me with photos. And all these people started asking me, to feed, how would you get all that publicity? You know, mm. like I'd go to a festival to perform, let's say a folk festival, and there would be a big headliner who was famous that everyone had heard of. And then 50 other, let's say, musicians at the festival. So the in the local newspaper, there'd be a big article about the big famous guy. And then there'd be a big article about me and then nothing else about the other 49. And so the other 49 would come ask, like, hey, you know, you're not famous like that guy. Like, how come they've written about you? So I learned a lot about how to get publicity. And so other people 
um, including, you know, business people and entrepreneurs later started coming to me and saying, Sufit, how'd you do that? And so slowly, slowly, I started coaching other people to, you know, follow their dreams, first of all, to figure out, you know, if they wanted to leave law and be a singer or whatever, uh, or if they're an accountant who wanted to be, uh, you know, a skydiver or whatever it was that they wanted to follow their dream business, and then how to promote it so that you could actually make a living doing it. So I've been um, making my living doing this for, I guess, uh, 16 years. Wow. so yeah and it's something i made up it's something i had no qualifications for i mean like i was qualified to be a lawyer i mean i was you know given a law degree but nobody gave me a degree in publicity or marketing or i mean i know that these degrees exist but i don't have one of them um so it was basically something that i had demonstrated to people by actually doing it you know i so my credentials were a stack full of newspaper articles or a national tv documentary or radio or tv appearances that i'd done and slowly started coaching um other people to do it and i've been doing that uh, consistently for years and i'm still doing it and when you first got your album done so there was no plan at the start of that to say, okay, I'm going to record this pl- this album, I need to find, you know, a publicist or, you know, in the music industry is going to publicise this CD for me. You literally just went out and recorded it, produced the CDs, and then you decided to do your promotion for yourself. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, the goal in doing the album was really just to perform. I hadn't really thought of what I was going to do beyond that. Yes. Um, but I realized, you know what, um, uh, if you have four kids, you really got to feed them more than once a week, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's like we have this um, artist here, Jan Arden in Canada, who said, um, you know, at Canada, you can, in Canada, you can headline at Maple Leaf Gardens and still have to take the subway home. And that's kind of like, I guess, Maple Leaf Gardens would be like um, Madison Square Gardens in New York or maybe Wembley Stadium in, in Britain. Yes. Um, you know, so so it doesn't matter how successful you are, at least at that time in the music business. And what I was doing was never going to be commercially broadly successful anyway, because it was kind of more folk and world beat and funny song and things like that, kind of more esoteric, eclectic stuff. Mm. So, so it really... At a certain point, I mean, how long can you do that? You know, you have four little kids. Um, I had to try to figure out something I could do that was more um, consistent. And um, so this coaching thing really made sense because people saw that I was able to get attention. They saw that I was able to get noticed. And then what happened was once I realized I was going to do it, Um, I heard about things like Board of Trade and Chamber of Commerce and, you know, BNI and all these networking places that that entrepreneurs go to. And um, so I went there to try to promote my coaching business. And they usually give you like 30 seconds, occasionally 60 seconds to kind of introduce yourself and say what you do. So I would do that. And I did it with humor. I did it comedically or I did it dramatically or whatever. And I would get clients doing it. So before you know it, people came up to me and said, Sufi, can you show me how you do that? And so I had another thing that, you know, <laughs> the learning annex taught me to, you know, got me to teach that, how you do 30 seconds. I now have a four-week program called 30 Seconds in the Spotlight, um, you know, which is all about how you stand out in just 30 seconds. And it all came from um, trying to promote my coaching business, which came out of the album. So, yeah, to answer your question. No, I had no thought to, um, you know, how I was really, well, I, you know, I say no thought, but that doesn't mean I wasn't reading, uh, you know, I was reading books about how to promote stuff. Yeah, I understand. But, you know, it's, it's fascinating. And the reason I asked the question and why I wanted to explore this, because lots of us small business entrepreneurs have an idea to get started with something but haven't thought through the whole journey. You know, what happens next after I do this bit? You just have a belief that I'm going to do this. I want to do this. I think it's a good idea to do it. I can make a living from this. And then when you get there and you've done it, you've got to do the next thing to promote it or 
to present it or to publicize it or do whatever. And it's a lot of small business people kind of uh, learn on the job, if you know what I mean. And that sounds very much like what you were doing. Yeah, you know, the truth is I don't really remember what the what the real answer to your question is. I don't mm. really remember because it's not really like me no. to not think about the next step. But, but you know, it's interesting because I, one thing I can tell you for sure is that when I wrote my book, which came after about, you know, six years of having been a coach, you know, I'd wanted to write one my whole life. But when I when I did that, at least two or three years before, I was reading books about how to promote books before I had my book. Right. So I definitely, you know, when it came to that, I definitely gave it a lot of forethought. Yeah. Yeah. And I was really looking forward to the day when I would actually have the book to hold in my hand and, you know, was almost looking forward to the promotion of the book more than, you know, finishing writing it. Mm, absolutely. Well, and and what oh, by, by the way, the book is called the book is called Step into the Spotlight a Guide to Getting Noticed. So it's actually about what we're talking about yeah about how to stand out and get noticed now, just one more one more thing about that uh, while we're on the topic of that because so i told you that at the beginning my my uh promotion was really about uh or sorry my my career was really about coaching people to follow that dream and that's initially what my business was called that's initially what my business card said and then um after uh i had um uh you know, promoted that for a while, um, I realized, you know what, it's one thing to have a dream and to follow that dream, but you got to really figure out how to make money for from mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and, and how to promote it. So, um, so my initial book was going to be called some version of follow that dream. Yes. Um, and I wrote a lot of that book and then I realized you know what, there's a zillion contrillion books like that in the bookstore. And then I started writing a book called How to Be Your Own Publicist, because that's what I had learned. And then I was in a store one day, and then I saw a book called How to Be Your Own Publicist. And I thought, okay, well, that's not going to make me stand out. So it really took me rejecting those first two books that I'd put a lot of work into to come up with something that I could brand to myself that would truly be something I would own in the marketplace that would be uniquely mine. And that was Step Into the Spotlight, A Guide to Getting Noticed. And that's really the brand. So, you know, my LinkedIn group, which I'm sure you'll discuss afterwards, yes. is called Step Into the Spotlight. My first initial 10-week online self-study program was called Step Into the Spotlight. Um, all the, you know, the book is called Step Into the Spotlight. So all the branding is consistent around that one idea. So when somebody, and, I, and I've trademarked it. Mm. So, um, so that was kind of the... Um, wasn't the book that I originally, you know, thought that I was going to write. And it wasn't the first one that I worked on or yeah. even the second, really the third. Oh, so did you have to rewrite it then? Yeah. Well, what happened was, so the first follow that dream book, I just thought, you know what, this is just like too, you know, it's everywhere. Everybody's written a version of this. So that, that wasn't going to do it for me. The second one, how to be your own publicist was really good stuff in there. But again, it wasn't that unique and it wasn't that sexy or interesting. I had written it kind of in the voice of a lawyer uh, because that was the first thing that I, you know, that, that was kind of where I was, right? Yes. When I decided to write Step into the Spotlight, A Guide to Getting Noticed, I decided that that whole How to Be Your Own Publicist book, which was probably, I mean, I wasn't done it, but it was probably going to be about 200 pages, 180 pages, could only really be one chapter in the Step into the Spotlight book, right? Step in the Spotlight has seven chapters. Um, and, um, you know, so the first one is called getting them to stop on your channel. That's kind of an introduction to the idea of getting noticed. The second chapter is called the department of chutzpah, which is really, you know, chutzpah is a, a, a Jewish word for, um, uh, what is it like? Not nerve or gall, but it's like daring, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, attitude is everything. Chapter three, I'm ready for my close up. Mr. DeMille is all about being seen. It's all about the branding. Yes. Chapter four is this thing on, you know, how a comedian says, is this thing on about the microphone when he yes. doesn't get a laugh? Yes. That's chapter four. That's about being heard. So that's about speaking and the 30 second networking infomercial. And it wasn't until chapter five of the book, five out of seven, that I found a place for that whole big, long 200 page book, of course, I had to condense it a lot. And I ended up calling it extra, extra, read all about it or how to get your face in the newspaper without robbing a bank. 
And that <laughs> chapter, chapter five is called the power of publicity. Um, I'll just finish it just because yes. I hate incomplete things. Chapter six is called everyone's a critic, which is all about, you know, what to do, the show must go on, what to do when people criticize you. Yes. And chapter seven is just called step into the spotlight, like actually telling you to go and take action. But anyway, out of all the chapters that I told you, chapter five was really that whole big long book, that second book that I'd written condensed into a chapter. And so right. I had a problem. I had a problem. The voice was different. The, the, the step into the spotlight book that, that, you know, people are reading now, the, the one that, you know, won the award is written in the voice of a comedian. It's a serious marketing book, mm. but it's funny. Like people laugh out loud. It's full of attitude. It's irreverent, right? Mm. The chapter five that I stuck in that other book was written more in the voice of a lawyer. It was like a how-to book, you yes. know, and it was boring compared to the rest of this book, which is easy reading and fun. And so, you know, when I went to, I had three different editors on this book, but one of the editors, she really had to help me be ruthless and cutting it down and, and changing the voice to the consistent Sufit voice that people know now, not the lawyer voice, but the, you know, the more comedic voice. And, um, so that's, that's how that, um, uh, that, book was was born it was a, a bit a bit of growing pains with that chapter five because at the beginning it didn't fit with the rest of the book i think it's incredibly courageous to write two books and go no i'm not happy with them but i've got to write a third one and then rewrite stuff uh or wanting to use stuff from a previous book in the new book then having to rewrite that again so but obviously Thank you. but it is Thank courageous you. because most people will go well i would well, I've written a book. No, I'm not changing it. I've put so much work into it. I'm going to publish it. <laughs> you know. Well, here's the, here's the challenge with that. Here's the challenge with that, Michael. Yes. The challenge with that is I am my expertise is getting noticed. Mm. Okay? What I teach is how to get noticed, how to get seen, how to get heard, how to get noticed, maybe even if you want to how to get, you know, um, known in a bigger way. So, if I had there was a practical, you know, cur courageous. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. But mm. there was a practical component to it because if I had written and published that first book on follow that dream, it would have been like a zillion other books out there. If I had done the how to be your own publicist, it was more like a how to. That's almost like a self counsel press book, you know, one of those how to dry, boring. I mean, it wasn't boring. It was still, you know, had had some flavor to it. Sure. Uh, but it was very instructional. And I decided if I was going to make a mark in this world, if I was going to practice what I preach, if I was going to stand out and get seen and get heard and get noticed and get known, I mean, you know, it can't be a shoemaker has no shoes situation. It mm. has to be that my book gets noticed, that my book gets known. Mm. And I didn't think it would happen with one of the first two books. So I really had no choice. I mean, I was, I coached myself the way I coach my clients and, you know, my clients come to me with versions like version one and version two of my book, right? Yes. Not, those are two different books. They come with their big idea. They come with either a book or a speech or a business idea. And I say the same thing to them that I said to myself, yeah, I know you put a lot of work into this, but are you, is this the thing that's going to get you noticed? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it is. And they hate to hear that, of course, if they put a ton of work into it, just like I hated to hear it from myself. Yeah. Um, but if I was being honest with myself, you know, I had to do something to make a mark. Otherwise, why would anybody ever come to me for coaching? Yeah. You know, if I couldn't show that, and this book did get noticed and it won an award and it, you know, it's still, people are still buying it and they buy cases of it and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's launched a lot of other things. And I'm glad because I don't think that would have happened with the first or the second, um, book that I had attempted to. Yeah. You know, what would. I don't know if you've come across this saying, but I use this a lot with people. What, you, what you've what you done, you're the perfect example of eating your own dog food. Do you, do you, <laughs> <laughs> do you get that what saying? A, what an undelicious way of putting it. <laughs> no, Drink it's, my own Kool-Aid, yeah. Yeah, um, you, you, you're you're practicing what you're preaching and you did okay it. like that better walk the talk yes. yeah okay, you, that works better for me i don't eat dog food but yeah no, okay but the the what well, could be cat food but oh the, you grits <laughs> and your silly expressions okay <laughs> but the 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 metaphor is not lost on me the thing is what you did 
is you practice what I teach. Yeah, yeah. yeah, what you teach, but you had to go through it yourself first in order to be able to give that guidance to other people. This is often what happens. We we go through the lessons ourselves first and then we're better qualified to then teach others about the same journey. And that's absolutely right. So I think that's really, really fascinating how you've done that. And obviously you can share that journey with other people to get them to appreciate it. But it also means you come from a place of empathy that even though you may be giving them you know, constructive critique on what they've done, you know that you've done that journey too. So you can have empathy for what they've gone through, but also help them to get them to the other side. And because this- And, and you know, sorry, sorry, Michael, just before you go yeah. on, people people hate that. Mm. People hate that when you tell them that. And, um, and Why? you know, occasionally I, I had one client really so mad about it that she discontinued working with me and she was really mad when I told her, you know, I'm not sure the world needs another book on leadership right now. Like, not that she shouldn't write a book about leadership, but what she had described to me was like my first two books, you know, like who cares and who needs it and whatever. And uh, like three years later, I think, or maybe two years later, I got a voicemail, which I think I kept on my machine saying, to feet, you were so right. You know, so people don't always, you know, 99% of the time at the time, you know, they don't like it, but they appreciate it and they know that it's true. But occasionally people just get so mad, mm. but then they come back later. Um, and sometimes I forget, like I had a woman come up to me uh, at a networking event and she said, thank you so much to feed. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I've never seen you before in my life. I didn't say that, but I'm thinking it right. Mm. Um, and she goes, yeah, three years ago, I, t I had a brief conversation with you and you told me this, this, and this, and I did what you said. I had no recollection of meeting her. I had no recollection of saying it, but it sounded like something I might say. So I, you know, I thought she's probably telling the truth. Um, and of course she was, you know, she had acted on it. Um, but sometimes you just have to, um, I mean, a coach has no value if the coach doesn't say the tough things. And it, 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 I guess another skill is finding a way to say the tough things without having everybody hate you. And, <laughs> and one, of the, one of the ways to do it is with humor. Um, and, um, and I think that's one of the reasons I got away with it. Like you have, you have a Brit, uh, Simon uh, Cowell. Yo, who, yes. On, <laughs> on, um, uh, on uh, uh, American Idol. Yes. You know, there was him, there was uh, Paula Abdul, who actually I mentioned these two in my book. Uh, I met Paula a few years uh, after I wrote my book. And um, I was really embarrassed to give her a copy of the book because in the book, I had mentioned how we trust Simon's opinion more than Paula's. I never thought when I wrote it that I was going to meet Paula and give her a copy of the book. Mm. And, and so I was kind of embarrassed. I thought, okay, I better not wait till she finds this paragraph. I better just, you know, mea culpa admit it and, and apologize. And she laughed, said, oh, don't worry about Safid. Everybody says that. Um, but the point is, Simon Cowell, people really trusted him because he, he told the truth, right? He, was, he didn't all sugarcoat it. Not that it's, you know, sugarcoating has its place. And Paula Abdul did people a service by picking out the nice things that they did. Yes. You know, you have a nice tone or whatever. Uh, Simon didn't have that filter. I don't think I would have survived in this business as long as I have if I had been only like Simon. Mm. Um, but I kind of him with a bit of a sense of humor so that they take it better. Yeah, I, th I think Simon has had the same opinion in this country. I mean, especially when he first started, I think people can, they realize now where he's coming from. And actually, although he's fairly big headed about his opinions and what he thinks is right, unfortunately, he is often right. <laughs> He's often right. Yeah. He's often right. He just, he just, you know, he doesn't say it in the most diplomatic way. So, you know, l I say it a lot more diplomatically than yes. him. Yes. But the bottom line is, you know, I say in one of my programs, it says right on the sales page, if you want your truth wrapped up in a pretty red bow, you know, Sufit is not for you. Um, I don't wrap it up in a pretty red bow. I give it to you straight, just like I gave it to myself straight. And if I hadn't given it to myself straight, the book would not have had this. Well, it wouldn't be this book, but it wouldn't have had the success that it had. I don't think we'd be talking today. Mm. So who has inspired you on your journey in business and media and public life and all the different things that you're doing? Have you got a role model that you've gone? Actually, that person, that celebrity or apart from Simon, maybe it is Simon, um, you know, they've really helped me 
focus on what I'm doing for people in a better way. Okay, let's get this clear. It's definitely not Simon. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's get that out of the way. Um, and you know, it's funny because I ask this question a lot. I ask it of clients. I ask it in my LinkedIn group. Right. Um, I don't actually have one answer to this question. I read more than anyone I know. Right. I have, I own more books than anyone I know. And I've just given away hundreds, if not, so well, probably not thousands, but yeah, maybe hundreds and hundreds of books. And I still have hundreds and hundreds more here, probably thousands here. Um, I read, 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 read. I read biographies. I read business books. I read fiction. Um, oh. I watch movies. I, I listen to audio tapes. I listen to video. Like I just take it in from every source. I, biographies I find very, very inspiring. Mm. Um, but I can't tell you any particular person. Um, I just, I, I learn something. I mean, it's not a very sexy answer, but I, no. I learn something from everyone. I Right now, for example, this morning, um, before our call, I am rereading a book that I read about, um, a couple of years ago. There's a book called, um, I think his last, I think his last name is Gill, Michael Gates Gill, I think is his name. He wrote a book called how Starbucks saved my life. Right. So I read that a few years ago, um, about this 53 year old executive advertising exec who worked on big, you know, like Ford and big, um, uh, accounts was summarily fired when he was 53. He was a, a, you know, son of a guy who worked for the New Yorker, uh, Brendan Gill, and um, just had never had to work to get a job, everything silver spoon handed to him. And all of a sudden, he has no job, and he's feeling down. And he goes to Starbucks to buy himself a latte. And this, it turns out it's a hiring day. And this woman sitting there says, you want a job? <laughs> So this guy earning all this money at this big ad firm, he was a VP of, you know, an, an account executive, takes a job working at Starbucks as a barista. So he wrote this book, How Starbucks Saved My Life. And this morning I was reading, and the reason I was reading it is because I'm trying to get rid of books. But before I get rid, so I give away hundreds and hundreds. I, the last few weeks I've taken probably, you know, dozens and dozens to Value Village, I've taken, which is a resale store. I've taken um, about 10 bags of books to my local chamber of commerce because there were business and marketing books. But before I give it away, I have to look at it and think, oh, can I bear it apart with this? So I was picking up this one. It's a sequel to How Starbucks Saved My Life called, I think it's How to Save Your Life, or I forget what it's called. It's not <laughs> a very good title. This, the, the, good, the first title is a great title. The second title, if he had come to me, I'd said that's a rotten title. Same with but anyway, movies. <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't need my advice. His first one was on the New York Times bestseller list. I'm not sure about the second. Anyway, I'm reading it, and I find that inspiring mm. because he's writing about people who, you know, how his life is so much better. Now, I think he's, at least at the time he wrote the second book, he was still working at Starbucks while he had a bestselling book and traveling around speaking and inspiring people. And people were coming to him and sharing their stories of, you know, the difficult situations that they were escaping. So I find inspiration, and all of that to say, not that this particular guy I would ever say is an inspiration to me, mm. but his story in that book is something that, you know, it, it's helpful. Like he has this chapter about how leap, he said, don't think about it all in your head. Just if you know you need to make a move, just make a move. Yes. So I look at my own life and I think, you know, should I, am I sitting here agonizing about making a move or should I just be leaping? Yeah. So I get that kind of inspiration from um my clients from my you know from from books that i read from authors like al reese who wrote you know uh, positioning with jack trout um and i get to know a lot of my mentors too uh, a lot of these people that inspire me because a lot of them ended up uh, endorsing my book so mm. um you know i reached out to these perfect strangers and they many of them were really really kind endorsed the book so i get to know them afterwards as well i love it i i I think it's great to get inspiration across the board of many people rather than just one, you know, one kind of person that inspires you. So I think that's really, really great advice. So what what have been some of the challenges in, you know, doing this? Um, and But also let's balance it out. And what, what are some of the highlights? Because I'd like to tease it out and hear hear those from you as well, please. <laughs> you know, let me tell you a, a funny story about the challenges. Mm. So a few years ago, um, I was being interviewed for a national TV documentary. 
um, it was a series about people's careers, like second careers, like mm. because I had left law and I was doing this coaching thing. And um, so they're filming this documentary. They come, they film me, they interviewed my producer of my music CD. They interviewed um, a client of mine. They interviewed um, an actress who had acted with me in the commercial. Um, they interviewed my children, a, a bunch of people, right? And at a certain point, they turned to me and they asked in a very uh, serious voice with some gravitas, the same question that you just asked. Um, Sufi, tell us about the obstacles. Tell us about the challenges in your life. And I'm a very private person, Michael. I don't like to share that stuff, right? Mm. I, you know, I share all the good stuff. I don't like to share that stuff. So I came up with, I said, ah, it's been pretty good. You know, things have gone well. And, you know, like just sort of telling them the raw, raw answer. Yes. The guy, the producer behind the camera, um, tells the cameraman, turn off the camera. <laughs> he interrupts the thing and he says, Sufi, we need some obstacles. <laughs> so he knew his, he knew his documentary formula included, okay, look at all she's doing now and look how successful she is and look at this, and look at this, but Sufi, we need some challenges. So they turned the camera back on. I came up with some bull, you know, challenges because the truth is I'm a private person and you're not going to make me say what I don't want to say. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, so I said things like, um, oh yeah, you know, I have four little kids. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll just take a sip of water. Okay. See, I just revealed a challenge to you. Yes. Instead of covering my microphone um, and, you know, not wrecking your beautiful recording, I admitted my, my vulnerability and I'm taking another sip right now. Here we go. There you go. There's two feet being vulnerable. Perfect. So what I did... <laughs> You, normally, I wouldn't do that. Normally, I'd cover my mic and you wouldn't know that I was being vulnerable. Anyway, so what I did was I, I, I came up with some, and it was true, that, you know, while all the other ki kids had all these things and they were being taken to Canada's Wonderland, which is like the Canadian version of Disneyland, you know, with my kids, I was buying them secondhand clothing and whatever because I wasn't a lawyer anymore and I wasn't earning all that money. Um, uh, uh, but I, the truth is I love buying secondhand stuff even for myself. I appear mm. on national television in stuff that I get complimented on or I appear, you know, speaking. And when somebody comes up and compliments what I'm wearing, I say, yeah, four ninety nine at the thrift stop and shop, just like uh, Barbara yeah. Streisand used to do. Yes. Anyway. So I admitted that vulnerability, which is a true one, you know, about how it's challenging having four little kids and, and, you know, being self-employed and whatever. But the truth is, you know what? I'm not all that eager always to face the challenges. You know, mm -hmm. that's one of them. Another challenge is you sometimes feel like a fake. You know, you sometimes feel like when you're struggling, like here I am, Little Miss, you know, uh, attract, don't chase, you know, because that's one of the, the, the main tenets of my book is yes. about how to attract clients not to chase them. And occasionally I'd find myself in a conversation and I'd say, Sufi, you're actually contradicting yourself. You know, I'd say in my head, wait, uh, you're actually chasing this guy instead of, so I, you know, so that's one of the challenges you think, okay, I'm teaching this stuff. But am I actually living it? And 99% of the time, I'm happy to say, um, 98, 97, I'm more or less living, practicing what I preach. But occasionally, you know, you feel vulnerable. You feel like, oh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a little slow this month or what do I have to do or whatever. So you start to do some of the things that you, you're teaching people not to do. And so you feel a bit of a fake. So those are the challenges. Those are, mm. um, the main, um, you know, we all go through that. We, you know, I had a, financial advisor is a client who drove up to a session in a bmw right so outside wealth right and he couldn't even afford our session like so he, he was struggling and a lot of people do that and they just fake it um there's a lot of that and i've had a lot of clients who are ceos who um they have that fraud syndrome um i think we all suffer from that um and uh, so that's a vulnerability and then the second part of your question were was some of the highs yes please. Um, yeah, so highs are, um, you know, national TV documentary wouldn't, you know, that's nice. Yeah. Um, having competitors, you know, I had a competitor in New York City who teaches publicity buy 200 copies of my book to give to his clients. I mean, that's that's a high that mm. because it, it comes with his implied endorsement. You know, why else would he be giving them the book unless he thinks it's a good book? Yeah. 
Um, so that's a high, um, just seeing the, you know, the client's eyes light up. I mean, now I do most of my coaching by phone, but you know, when I was doing in person, just seeing the eyes light up, um, Dan Kennedy, who's one of my all time heroes. Um, for those of your listeners who don't know who Dan Kennedy is, he, um, coaches billionaires and multimillionaires and just regular Joes on marketing. He's written a ton of book, no BS marketing, um, guides. And I, um, you know, like Al Reese and Jay Conrad Levinson and, and, you know, a bunch of my mentors, I had the opportunity to interview him. And at the end of the interview, um, he sent me a manuscript of his upcoming book and on the cover, he had written something. I don't have it in front of me, so I don't remember the exact words, but, um, he, he had handwritten in, in turquoise ink on the manuscript. The book wasn't yet out of his upcoming book. Um, one of the best, best interviews done with me ever, <laughs> uh, you're a pro exclamation mark. And Dan Kennedy is known. He calls himself the professor of harsh reality. I mean, I talk, I talk about, I don't, t you know, wrap up my advice in a pretty red ribbon. Mm. He's like harsh. Right. Harsh, yeah. Um, and so to get that from him, um, was a real career high for Al Reese who wrote the co-wrote positioning to say, I think he said something at the end of our interview. I don't remember exact words, but it's something about uh, it, you know, me being astute or again, I forget the, what the words were <laughs> little things like that from people that I, or even just getting the endorses that I got. I mean, you know, Robert Cialdini who wrote influence, you know, said we'd be fools not to pay close attention mm. to this book. You know, Tom Peters yes. um, said my book was necessary and delightful. You know, Jay Conrad Levinson who wrote 60 books on marketing, Ivan Meisner, who, you know, found mm. a BNI mm. that it's an extraordinary book and told the whole world about it in his BNI uh, website. So things like that, Les Brown. So th those are career highs as well for me to have my mentors, Jack Trout, he passed away since then, but also said, you know, the book is must reading. Those are highs for me. They are. And, oh, and also, and also my dad, you know, before he passed away, um, he didn't read the book for a few years. He had it. And then when he finally read it, he said something really good about it. Those are also highs for me. And, and having my kids, you know, uh, respect is a high for me. And, you know, sorry, sorry, one last thing. One of my daughters is, yes. two of my daughters are entrepreneurs, but one of my daughters who does something similar to me is telling me, oh my God, I meet people and they say, oh my God, she's your mom. You know, can I meet her? Like, and, and she said, my daughter who teaches also says not a day goes by that I don't mention. I mean, that's a real career high too. Yeah. And, Brilliant. And thank you so much for sharing both challenges and highlights, because there is always balance, isn't there? We we may get some challenges in running our own businesses, but we also get the highlights and they're there to balance things out and make sure that we, we feel good about ourselves <laughs> as well. Um, so I want to move on to LinkedIn, because that's where we met and started chatting and first of all, I want to congratulate you because I've been a real critic of LinkedIn and LinkedIn groups. For years now, LinkedIn groups have been dying slowly or quickly, probably. And because all that people have done, they've literally, by trying to stand out, they've just been posting links and advertising and everything. And you've created a group with, I think, 8,000 people in it that that is only having real conversations. And so, uh, first of all, I applaud you for having a group on LinkedIn. And you'll probably believe when I say this, I've purposely come out of every single group. And the only group I'm in now is your group. <laughs> oh, thank you. And, and I've got one group as well. I'm, I'm, I'm in that group, but I'm, it's not active at all. And but so the only group I'm in now on LinkedIn is you. I've come out of every single one. I don't need to be in the groups where people just advertise and I don't need to be kind of going, hello, look at me. But I think the so what, how did that come about and how did you manage to keep it, as I probably would say, clean of advertisements? <laughs> Okay, so good question, Michael. And first of all, we're not quite at eight thousand yet. Um, we're, I think, at the time we're recording this, probably over seventy three hundred. But okay. hopefully, by the time this airs, maybe even if it's tomorrow, all <laughs> your listeners will flood it. That's right. Uh, and uh, and we'll be there. So I'll just give the it's a spotlightgroup.biz. 
B-I-Z at the end, spotlightgroup.biz. Yes. Um, request to join. And if you tell me Michael sent you, then I might even accept you. So um, to answer your question, how did it come about? So it was January 1st, um, a little over five years ago. And I'm sitting at my desk. I mean, January 1st is a holiday, right? It's New Year's. So I, yes. you don't have to be working. But as an entrepreneur, you work eight days a week. And <laughs> there's another vulnerability. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, okay, what am I doing here with this business? Like, what am I going to do? You know, what am I going to do differently? What am I going to do this year? Um, and I was thinking about the idea of maybe at some point I might like to get sponsorship. And I thought, well, okay, but what am I going to offer them? I have to have a community to show them that I have a voice. And I thought, you know what? I should start a group and kind of on a whim. Now I haven't monetized it in any way, really, I guess, uh, although uh, unless you count getting direct clients, but I haven't like taken sponsorship. Mm. Um, and, um, so what I, um, what I have done is, um, uh, I'm sitting there and I just kind of on a total, total whim, I said, you know what, let me, um, just, uh, try this. Let me just try this. And I created a group. Now I wasn't ever really that active on LinkedIn. I had a client who wanted to learn about LinkedIn. So I, I'm always one step ahead on some, you know, if it's not my subject, either I refer them to somebody else or I get one step ahead of them. So I got one step ahead and started building my own network, um, which is larger than the membership of my group right now. Mm. Um, and, um, and then I thought, yeah, on a whim, let me start this group. So I remember getting to a hundred people and I thought, wow, that's amazing. Um, so I, I just started the group. And, um, I told, I call, I named it step into the spotlight because that's the name of my book. And I thought, well, the branding, you know, should be right. Yes. And it should also be appealing to other people. Like it shouldn't just be an esoteric thing that only applies to me because there are groups there where the group is really around only that person's idea or that person's, you know, book or job, but it's not relevant to the audience. So I decided it had to be a name that was relevant to the audience, which that was because yes. a lot of people want to step into the spotlight so i started the group and i started growing it and then i'm a member of whatever the limit is now i think 100 there was a time i was a member of 104 it, when i started it was 50 groups yeah, that's and right. most of them are as you say bulletin boards for people to post what they're doing now the truth is i like to post what i'm doing too like for example tomorrow the day after we're recording this i'm doing a um you know a live teleseminar for you know a couple of hundred uh, coaches. Um, and I haven't even posted that in my group yet because it would violate my own rules. Mm. Now I may, I may post it at the last minute for a short time and then take it down after, because you know what? I put day and night into that group and I've made an exception for myself after five years, but normally we don't like that stuff, right? Sure. Um, uh, because otherwise it would be nothing but a bulletin board. And we do have a conversation where you can showcase what you're working on. So, um, there is a place for that anyway. So how do I keep it? Um, it's interesting what you say about um, that they're so uh, the groups are so quiet. There was one guy who wrote in the Huffington Post an article about how LinkedIn groups have become a ghost town, and he happens to be a member, um, uh, JD Gershbeim of our group. Oh yeah, I know, uh, I know him well. And, yes, yeah, and so he wrote uh, two at least two solid paragraphs about how step into the spotlight is the exception to that, and we got a bunch of people joining our group. He wrote in the Huffington Post business about it. We got a bunch of people joining our group because of his article. And there have been other, you know, interviews on other LinkedIn um, programs and whatever asking about the group and other telesummits and boot camps asking about it. So basically what I do is I ask people to post short interactive questions about marketing, about publicity, about speaking or publishing, about stepping into the spotlight. Brilliant. And when people post self-promotional stuff, um, I put them on moderation. I gently tell them, um, you know, please have a look at our group rules. And usually they're very good at being compliant. Other people are never compliant. So their, their posts never see the light of day. Mm. Um, and, and other members are good about telling me if they see stuff. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's how we do it. We keep it. Oh, and the other thing is one of the ways that the group uh, got so interactive was I purposely sought out people that I saw that were being, you know, good voices in other groups, like people who were, you know, posing good questions or even better making good comments on other people's questions. I, you know, if people ask me who's more valuable, the people who post good 
posts or the people who post good comments to their posts. I would say the latter. Um, people who comment on other people's posts are the most valuable in a group. Yeah. Um, cause it's easy to post a post, but it's, it's, you know, you, you really want that interactivity. Totally. And I, yeah. And I invited a bunch of big mouths to join, you know, <laughs> opinionated people. So sometimes it gets out of hand and you have to come in and moderate. Yes. Um, but that's why the group is still active uh, despite, you know, all the LinkedIn challenges with notifications because there are people who tell me exactly as you have, Zufid, it's the only group I'm in. It's the only group I, maybe I'm in 10 groups, but it's the only group I participate in. It's the only group I'm in every single day um, because we keep it interactive. And the other thing I do is I try to support the members of the group. So when, when I see a publicity opportunity that's not for me, or maybe it is for me, I will um, actually tell other people in the group about it. Um, I will send private messages to, there was once a, a post I saw on Haro, Help a Reporter Out, um, asking to interview CEOs of successful businesses, you know, who, you know, did big business or whatever. That's not me. I have a small little business. Mm. Um, but I knew two group members. We have a group member who um, was a co-founder of ACT Software. We have a group member who's the founder of UGS. I mean, so, you know, I sent them a private note and saying, you know, um, this might be a good opportunity for you. And one of them, five minutes later, said, great. I contacted the guy and he's interviewing me. So people get clients from it. People get publicity from it. Um, and that's another reason um, that they stay active. People have publicly posted that they've gotten clients from the group. Mm. Well, I, I, all the work that you're doing, you know, not just creating the group, but posting the questions and engaging with what other people are putting. I mean, that's a huge amount of selfless, time-consuming activity, and I really, really applaud you for it. I'm not just saying that because I know how much work is involved in it. And but thank you for doing it. And people well, may I not appreciate be people may not believe me, but I'm seriously, you are the only group I'm in now. <laughs> well I, I, I Michael, I really, really appreciate it and I appreciate the compliment and I appreciate you saying it's selfless. It's not selfless. Let's be truthful here. Um, I mean, not that you weren't truthful, but I'm. Here's another, uh, not a vulnerability, but I, I, I promised you honesty, and that's what I deliver. Mm. It's not even slightly selfless. It's completely self-interested. Okay, completely self-interested. What? I, you know, I'm not Mother Teresa. No. I, I love the idea of building a community, and it's not even just ego-driven. I mean, there's some people who would do it for ego, yes. right? That yes. Look, I'm the leader of this group. No, it takes way too much time. I can stroke my ego way easier. All I have to do is get on stage and sing or tell a joke, yes. and I'll get my applause. <laughs> I don't need to spend day and night on this group, and really for over five years. Like, you know, before I go on a trip, I have to find babysitters for the group, you know, because I – um I'm really su such a strong presence there. And when I travel, I usually travel without uh, devices. Mm. So it's not self selfless. It's completely self-interested. I wanted initially to create a community so that I would be able to um, use that, you know, either through getting sponsorship, which I don't even know if you can do on LinkedIn. So I haven't done anything about that or, to get more people to buy my book, which they have. I mean, most people that um, are interested in, you know, joining a group like that are open to that. So I don't, I don't approach them to buy the book, but many of them do buy the the book by going to here's a little plug spotlightbook.com. Yeah. And, um, and uh, the other thing is that people approach me directly. They say, you know what, you're doing what I want to be doing. Can you coach me? Yeah. So I get coaching clients. I get people who take my 10 week program. Mm -hmm. I get people who introduce me to their group by interviewing me. I get asked to be on telesummits. I get media attention from it. So it's completely, I was going to say 100% self interested. That's not true. I, mean, I don't think that's you know, true. I, I, yeah, I no, genuinely not, yeah. don't believe it's true because we've had communications in the group and outside the group. And I wouldn't have thought that any of those communications were self interested. Those you're communications, right, right. I believe, were interested for the betterment of the group. So I, you're I, right. You're right about that. Yeah, you're I'm right. just and debating it a little yeah. bit. You're Don't right, get me right. wrong. You are showing us, you are teaching us how to step into the spotlight correctly by creating a group that's doing this. So I'm not, I'm not 
naive to think that you're not doing it for some self-promotion, but you deserve it, quite honestly. Because Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you deserve to be noticed because you're literally, going back to my metaphor, eating your own dog food. <laughs> oh, come on. we got to fix that metaphor, Michael. I hate that <laughs> Walking the talk. Come you on. are you are definitely walking the talk and and drinking my own smoothies. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, you know. It, it, thank you. And you know, in terms of the private conversations, that's the other thing people don't know. Mm. In addition to all the public moderation, I have to be mommy. Like yeah. I cannot tell you how many I get both sides of a fight. Yes, both sides saying, "Did you see what so and so?" Did, did oh, you say, uh, they should be banned from the group and then i get the other person i'm saying, so sorry say what she said? so and I, I cannot tell you how many of that i get or i get a third person complaining about the other two are fighting guilty i'm guilty um, <laughs> yeah so so yeah and that's that's just the tip of the iceberg no, but you but know you, what you dealt you deal with it so well so professionally Thanks. and with such love and so i really appreciate you for that I realize we've gone way over time, but this is so super interesting. Um, I'm um, we're going to wrap up shortly because I know you've got other stuff to do, but I just have one last question, a major one. Where where do you see your business going? What do you have a like a vision mission or where do you, you know, do you have some goal that you want to be achieving over the next five to 10 years? I wish I had some very inspirational <laughs> answer to that. Like, I want a better humanity. Yes. And I want every single person who has a message to be able to get it out into the world. And those are true. Yeah. They're true. Yeah. And that's the selfless version. Yeah. But again, the, the absolute truth is while, yes, I do want to help people get their message out there. And that it's true. Like I shouldn't, I should, I, I maybe I'm being a too simony on myself. You or are. Too, too hard on myself. Cause it is true. It is true. I do love to help people. I do love to see their eyes light up selfishly for me or not selfishly, but you know, for me, I have just like to sit by the beach and read a book. Mm. So if I could, you know, travel and sit by the beach and read a book when I feel like it and help people when I feel like it. Um, you know, I, I listen, I help people in the lineup. I told you Valley Village is a thrift store here. I'm in a lineup and a guy ahead of me in line has two items and a pair of two jackets and a pair of shoes. And I compliment the pair of shoes, let's say. And he goes, Oh, really? Okay. Well, what do you think of these two jackets? Right? He's about to pay for these two jackets. And I said, oh, this one? Yeah, great. The other one? Eh, not so much, right? Mm. He puts back the second jacket. Okay, this is a total stranger. Doesn't know me. And he's taking my advice. So it's a blessing. It's a curse. It's just me. It's what I do naturally. It's I see people like sometimes like a crooked picture on the wall and I think, can I help? <laughs> um, it is actually not only my pleasure to help them, but it's I won't say my obligation. It's I have no choice. Mm. Like it just comes out, right? Yes. I because it's a natural thing. So so yes, I want to continue helping people. I don't want to worry about what the next thing is going to be. Mm. Um, so my vision is to you know to continue to leverage it so that while I'm talking to you, Michael, somebody is taking my Spotlight 101 program. Somebody else is taking my book creation workshop program. We didn't even mention that, but I have a 10-week program about how to create a book because after my book came out, people said, how'd you get all those great endorsements? How'd you do it? Yes. You know, somebody's taking the 30 seconds program in Paris or whatever. So that's part of my vision to leverage it all so that I can be talking to you and, and still people are, are, are learning from me. Yeah. And that's, that's you know, that's, I mean, that model has existed for a while, but I think it's getting bigger and growing where people can go and do what they want to do because they've created all the content that people can just pick up and learn from and use. And that's one th good thing about the internet, <laughs> if you don't get any ice storms, where you, you can be doing those kind of things. And certainly, it's, you know, being able to pick up programs and learn them online has helped me enormously. So. The more of it that's out there, the better. And well done. Well yeah, done. yeah. And and for those of you listeners who don't know why Michael and I keep joking about ice storms, is <laughs> we went through a lot to bring you this episode today. That's right. Um, 
uh, you know, because uh, I'm in I'm in Canada, and I know we're supposed to keep these evergreen so that you can air it in summer and they, whatever. But behind the scenes vulnerability to feet, we need obstacles. Michael and I had an obstacle this morning, and um, you know there was no internet here, there was no electricity here, and uh, we we made it happen. He's in the UK, I'm in Canada, we made it happen. And, and just back to your last question about the. Um, the goal, my other goal, both from an altruistic, selfless point of view and also from a self-interested point of view, one of my goals is that the Step Into the Spotlight book be in the hands of every single entrepreneur who needs it. Yes. You know, every single entrepreneur who feels that they uh, he or she has a great service but isn't being noticed, um, you know, I want them to, to have access to the book. And, you know, whether you order the book at, you know, spotlightbook.com, uh, second time I'm mentioning it, or if you see how sneaky that was. <laughs> or if you just get your local library to order it for you, or maybe they already have it, um, that would be um, that would be part of my goal, both for for your listeners and um, for myself. And um, th- there's just one more little uh, uh, link I want to give you, but I'll Please. wait till you graciously ask me. I've how asked the question. Pretend I've asked the question. Give us all. Okay. The, give us all the links. All right. Okay. So if you want the book, spotlightbook.com. If, and you can find the Kindle version if you just search Step Into the Spotlight. If you want to join the group that is Michael's only active group right now, <laughs> spotlightgroup.biz. Yeah. You can also send me a personal invitation on LinkedIn. But most importantly, if you want some free tips, because Michael has already pointed out to you how selfless I am. <laughs> if you want some free tips See? on how to stand out and get noticed, and they really are free, Go to www.spotlightsecrets, that's secrets with an S at the end, dot com, Mm -hmm. spotlightsecrets.com. You'll get a form and then you'll put your name and your email. A second form will pop up because Canada has a strong anti-spam law where you put your, your name and the same email again. Don't misspell it. At least one in five people misspell their own email. Um, and you check your country and you check, send me the secrets and permission and all that stuff. And then you will get my spotlight secret series and we get fan mail for this stuff. So you can, and how can you contact me? You can reply to any one of those and I will personally get it. And if I like you, I may even respond. Fabulous. Oh, wonderful. I will include all of these website links in the show notes and obviously they can find you on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. And congrats on your show, Michael. Oh, bless you. Yeah, Yeah. This is really fun. Thank you so much for, my pleasure. Spending this time with me. There's some really valuable tips and ideas for our listeners and for me too. Of course, I'm always learning and um, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for making it through the ice storm and all the <laughs> challenges. <laughs> it was worth it just for your laugh. Doesn't Michael have a, a lovely infectious laugh? <laughs> well, yeah, you it. said some funny things. <laughs> um, I It's so good to to put a voice to the digital text that we've been doing online so thank it you nice. it's been absolutely fabulous i i could ask you a ton more questions but it's, it's getting too long otherwise no well we'll do another in, in two years from now we'll do a, a a replay i would love to i would love to thank you maybe Sufit. i'll do something new and exciting by then <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for spending the time with you and if you're ever in the uk or if i'm ever in the u in canada i should say then um we'd love to catch up with you for sure thank you and bye-bye bye-bye staying alive uk share your story 